Hello, everyone. Welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and geopolitics. Uh, we've been doing these SALT Talks, which are a, a series of digital interviews in lieu of our physical conferences uh, during this work from home period. And what we've really tried to do is expose our audience and let them into the minds of, of leading subject matter experts that are investors, creators, and thinkers. And then what we also try to do is provide a platform for a big world changing ideas. And we're very excited today to welcome uh, Jason Mudrick to Salt Talks. Uh, Jason is the founder and chief investment officer at Mudrick Capital Management, which is an investment firm that specializes in long and short investments in distressed credit. So this is obviously a very rich environment for his investment style. So we're looking forward to that conversation. Uh, Mudrick Capital was founded in 2009 with just $5 million under management. But uh, as of this month, uh, the firm has grown to manage approximately 2.4 billion, primarily for institutional clients. Uh, Jason began his career on Wall Street in 2000, advising on mergers and acquisitions uh, as an associate in Merrill Lynch's M&A department uh, in their investment banking group. And in 2001, he joined Contrarian Capital Management, where he began his focus on distressed investing. In October of 2002, Jason launched the Contrarian Equity Fund which is an investment vehicle focused on purchasing distressed debt that would be restructured into equity, post-bankruptcy equities, and other event-driven deep value special situations. Uh, Jason has served on multiple creditors committees and served on the board of directors of numerous public and private companies. Jason also spent two years in graduate school teaching economics classes to Harvard University undergrads. Uh, Jason has a BA in political science from the University of Chicago and a JD from Harvard Law School. Uh, he was also admitted to the New York State Bar. And hosting today's interview is going to be Troy Gajewski, who is a, a co-chief investment officer and senior portfolio manager and partner at Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm. And just a reminder to everyone watching, if you have any questions for Jason during today's talk, you can enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen. And with that, I'll turn it over to Troy for the interview. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We have a real pleasure to have Jason on today. You know, Jason and I go way back, back to 2002 at his contrarian days. So, you know, before we get in the meat and potatoes of uh, the strategy and the opportunity now, Jason, let's talk a little bit about your background and what it was like to get involved at contrarian back in 02 and 03 and run that successful uh, post reorg equity opportunity fund um, and how it makes you feel to be sandwiched not only between uh, or between Josh Freeman, the legendary distressed investor at Canyon, but coming up tomorrow, we have Dan Logue as well. That must make you feel pretty good, right? <laughs> yeah, th Troy, good to see you. And th thanks for having me. And yeah, you guys get an in incredible lineup uh, of speakers. This this is great. I've, I've been watching some of the series and it's been very informative. Um, so, you know, in terms of background, um, as John mentioned, I'm, I'm a lawyer. Um, I never practiced law, but went to law school uh, as a lot of people in this business did. Um, got my degree. Uh, joined Merrill Lynch uh, in, the, in their M&A group, as was mentioned. And then we went into recession. Um, it was the dot-com bubble. Uh, it burst in the summer of 2000. Uh, we went into that recession. Uh, and then I met the team up at Contrarian, um, as you mentioned, uh, joined them in 2001. And it was sort of off to the races. Uh, I started at Contrarian the day Enron filed for bankruptcy, uh, which at the time was the largest bankruptcy ever. Uh, and I left two weeks after Lehman filed, which, uh, you know, currently holds the title as the largest bankruptcy ever. Uh, so, you know, great time to be in the business. Uh, the, in the hedge fund industry was about 200 billion in 01. It got up to 2 trillion. So I got to see the institutionalization of the industry. Um, got to see two, you know, two great recessions um, uh, leading up to this one, this one being the third. Um, and then when the great financial a uh, crisis happened, uh, left Contrarian uh, to set Mudrick up, um, brought a couple guys with me, I hired a bunch of folks. Um, and that was 11 years ago, 11 and a half years ago. Uh, and as John mentioned, today we manage about two and a half billion. We have 30, 30 people here in New York, a couple people that sit in London. Uh, and uh, this will be the third cycle. And uh, it's the biggest one uh, that we've ever seen. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot about that today. Jason, that's great to hear more about your background. Uh, look, how, given your rich history, both in the 2001 to 2004 total distress cycle and really 07 through, you know, even as a distant or as 2010, 2011, how that informs your view on the current cycle 
And could you touch upon some of the similarities and differences between this cycle and the last two? Um, sure. Well, look, you know, all, all of these cycles are, are different in their own ways. Um, I think what um, what stands out about this one is the sheer size of it. Um, you know, if you think about what what led up to the cycle, we had the, the longest period of time between recessions, literally since like the 1850s, right? You had 11 years between between cycles. And um, that long period of time was character characterized by reasonable growth, but probably most importantly, uh, it was characterized by very low interest rates. And when you have a long period of time of good economic growth and low interest rates, companies borrow a lot. You know, and what we saw was the levered credit market, which you know are the companies that are most likely to get distressed. These are high yield issuers, levered loan issuers. That market was about 1.2 trillion in 08 during that last cycle, which was a huge market, right? It was up, you know, sixfold from the, you know, the 2000, 2001, 2002 recession, but today it's 2.8 trillion. So it grew, you know, 120% over the last 11 years. Um, and then you ha we had this very, that this very steep downturn. So while there's, while there's a ton of differences, what stands out to me is as the most unique thing about this cycle is there's almost $3 trillion of high yield bonds and levered loans outstanding. And we now have a recessionary type uh, economy with a whole bunch of industries that are going through rapid secular change brought upon and accelerated by COVID. Um, so hu huge supply of distress. Yeah, and coming into this cycle, leverage levels were meaningfully higher than they were going into the financial crisis for corporate America, correct, Jason? Yeah, so over the last six years, um, average debt to EBITDA multiples of new issue were over five times. The last time we had an average debt to EBITDA multiple that started with a five was 1998. Uh, and we had over five turns of, of, of debt to EBITDA at new issue for six years leading into this. Um, and by the way, I'll, as everyone knows, um, you know, EBITDA is an adjusted EBITDA. Right. Most of these are, are LBOs and there's various generous addbacks to EBITDA. So uh, if you're thinking about EBITDA as a proxy to operating cash flow and you take away the sort of questionable addbacks, those five, five and a half times debt to EBITDA was really like six, six and a half. And that was average. Uh, you know, th those were multiples uh, you know, for companies that expected to continue to grow. And nobody expected this recession. So not only do you have a lot of debt outstanding, but you have very, very high leverage multiples, which has you know, exacerbated the, the supply of distressed credit. Great. So stepping back from the current opportunity for a second, one of the things that you've stood out from the crowd in the last three to five years is despite the fact that there was fairly low supply of distressed uh, debt to invest in, you still made very attractive returns. Whereas, you know, unfortunately, most of your competitors struggled to make, you know, mid single digit returns. Can you talk about the style that led to that? Was it being smaller? Was it being more active? Was it being more opportunistic? What do you think drove those outstanding returns vis-a-vis -vis your competitors the last three to five years? Um, all three of those. Um, you know, uh, one thing that we've seen um, since the great financial crisis is, um, you know, most of the investment firms that specialize in distressed credit are very, very large. Okay, so a lot of the folks that um, you've had on on your talks, you know, you can think about, you know, Canyon, Aries, um, and I saw Mark spoke a couple of weeks ago. So Avenue, um, Anchorage, Davidson Kempner, Centerbridge, sort of go down your list, pick your top twenty uh, firms known for distressed investing, and they manage, you know, ten billion, twenty billion, you know, Oak Tree is, you know, eighty or hundred billion or however big they are, and. Um, so, you know, but by our estimates, about 85% of the capital dedicated to distressed investing sits in $5 billion and larger firms. But if you look at the corporate credit market, that's not what it looks like. You know, 85% of the corporate credit market is not large cap. It's actually 60% of it is small cap and mid cap. And we define mid cap as one to 5 billion of enterprise value. So most of the market is less than 5 billion of enterprise value, yet most of the uh, players in the market sit in firms that manage more than 5 billion. So, you know, that, that has a whole bunch of implications. A lot of those folks um, really need the Lehman Brothers and Enron's, um, you know, big situations, the Pacific Gas and Electrics, where they can go, you know, put hundreds of millions to work. Uh, and that's not where most of the opportunity set has been. Um, one, 
Two, you know, you 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 get very over diversified portfolios. I think it's very hard to concentrate when you're when you're running multi billion dollar portfolios. Um, it's hard to take five or ten percent positions, and you know, in 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 a world where there's few great uh, opportunities, um, I'm talking about sort of pre-COVID. We are we're in a cycle now, but when when we were in the late stages of the last cycle, there was very few differentiated positions. If you can't take big positions in them, it's just really hard to put up good numbers. Uh, in the, in this asset class, um, so you know our focus on middle market, um, being able to do the smaller stuff has differentiated. Um, you mentioned active involvement. We sit on twelve boards of directors today, um, and we're on five active creditors committee. It's you know been defining part of our strategy to be very involved in these situations, and particularly in some of the small and middle cap uh, situations, you really can drive the boat. You really can change the trajectory. There's not a lot of other distressed players in these situations. So we found that that's helped differentiate as well. Yeah, it's really interesting. We had Jerry Pascucci on from UBS, UBS yesterday, and he talked at length about there is a trend towards larger managers, but there's still those like yourself that are demonstrating that smaller size works to your benefit and can help you put up better risk-adjusted returns. So assuming you would agree with Jerry's conclusion? Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, look, it, it, it's it's a double-edged sword. I mean, it is a very resource-intense investment strategy. So you know, you can't do this with three people in a Bloomberg. Um, so there is sort of an optimal size, particularly today. Uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, new money opportunities. Um, it's very advantageous to get to 51% in a lot of these documents, uh, which are very covenant light. Uh, you've heard about, I, I assume, um, you know, the, the, the situation at J. Crew or at Travelport, which we're very involved in, uh, PetSmart, where assets are being stripped out. Um, it's hard to be small. It's hard to be very large. And I know it's, I'm self-serving when I say that, but uh, there, there is an optimal size where you have the resources. Uh, you can own enough of this stuff to drive the boat. Um, you can have a seat at the table, yet you're not so big that you're lethargic uh, and can only be involved in large cap situations. Great, great. So before we get into some of the distressed opportunities you're looking at today that were created by the pandemic, you, know, you have a very large investment in an e-cigarette company. And we know you think it's going to lead to tremendous upside. But before we get into the upside, can you talk about the societal impact and, and the positives that these companies can bring in terms of low and lowering morbidity and mortality rates uh, to smokers? Yeah, I'm glad you asked about that. I mean, you know, the e-cigarette industry has gotten a bad rap uh, over the last couple of years uh, because of a couple of bad actors, uh, the most notorious of which is Juul. Uh, there's been a rise in youth use, underage use of the products, but it is not across the entire category. It's not across all products. It really is uh, a jewel phenomenon. Um, um, and, you know, that has made um, this, this category talked about in a very negative light. But if you put that aside, um, you know, smoking related illness is the number one preventable healthcare problem we have in society. I know that's difficult to talk about given that we're dealing with this COVID situation, but 500,000 people in the US die every year from smoking related illness and 6 million people die every year globally from smoking. And 70% of smokers uh, wanna quit, right? So you really have a preventable problem. If you could give smokers an alternative, uh, obviously quitting would be the best alternative, but if they can't quit and they've tried over and over and over again, which a lot of them have, to give them a reduced risk product to continue to consume nicotine, could be more impactful to society than almost anything else uh, you can imagine. Um, so it has gotten a bad rap uh, and I get it uh, with youth use and that has to be arrested. Uh, but if you could figure out a way to switch smokers from combustible to vapor or heat not burn over the next 10 years, it's an incredibly socially responsible investment. Yeah, and this is a global problem as well, obviously. Right, Jason, it's like 14% of U.S. smoke, mainly a working class problem. But in terms of China and Germany and other countries, it's far more prevalent. No? Yeah, I mean, in, 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 in emerging markets, smoking rates are as high as 50%. Um, you know, we have one of the lowest smoking rates in the world um, at around 14%, but there's still almost 50 million Americans that smoke cigarettes. I mean, you know, we, I think in the investment world, we, we don't see it as regularly because, as you mentioned, it is primarily a, a blue collar. Uh, it's a, a, you know, very prevalent in our minority communities and our military communities. It's not necessarily something that um, is as salient to us on Wall Street anymore. I mean, we all have grandparents that 
died of lung cancer, or certainly I, I did. Um, um, but you know, it's sort of out of sight, out of mind, but that's not right. I mean, if you look at the actual numbers, $300 billion was spent last year on health healthcare related uh, costs associated with smoking illness. So it is a massive problem still. Yeah, so now that you touched upon how it can help society, how about some of the return potential? You know, and, and if you could talk through realistic return versus risk profile. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you know, it, it's very unusual um, to have a market as large as this that's highly regulated, um, that's being disrupted, right? Um, usually you need very high barriers to entry. The barrier to entry in this industry is regulatory driven, right? These products, uh, there's good products and there's bad products, but the science behind them, the technology uh, is, is, is pretty commoditized. There's nothing that unique about these products. What's unique about it is it's very hard to get a license. And the way the US regulatory um, machine is, is attempting to regulate this business is going to create very few players. It's gonna create effectively an oligopoly. And that process is ongoing as we speak. Um, and you know, the total addressable market is just huge. I mean, there's $100 billion just in the US, $100 billion spent every year on, on nicotine-related products. Uh, and 70% of smokers want to quit. Right? 80% of that $100 billion is still combustible cigarettes. So $80 billion is spent every year. So if, if you believe, as I do, that half the market will go the way of risk, you know, reduce risk products over the next 10 years, you're talking about $40 billion of revenue uh, on top of the 10 billion or so that's already spent uh, on, on uh, vapor products. You're gonna have a $50 billion market over the next 10 years. That's probably gonna be accessible for four, five, six, seven type of players. I mean, literally the, the regulatory environment is creating, look, we, we just applied for our license. It's called a PMTA, a pre-market tobacco application in March. And to complete our application, we had to spend over $20 million. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the data that we had to show the FDA, they're the regulatory body in charge of this. A lot of the data that we had to show the FDA was historical um, population level data, survey work. Um, uh, and if you're not an incumbent, if you're not an existing player, you can't show that. So even if we could round up the money uh, from venture capital firms or collectively to come up with a new product and go try and get a license, we wouldn't be able to show any of that historical data. Um, and the risk uh, would, be very, would be very skewed to the, to the downside for, for a new launch. So uh, I think unintentionally, but it's the reality, they're creating a market where only incumbent players are going to get licenses. And a lot of the smaller players aren't going to be able to afford to put together a, a comprehensive application. You know, if you fast forward 12 months from now or 18 months from now, and this regulatory uh, approval process is through, I think you're going to have five to seven players uh, in a market that, you know, like I said, I think could be, you know, on the scale of a hundred billion in size over the next 10 to 20 years. Has the pandemic slowed down uh, the rate of crossover from those addicted to cigarettes to uh, vaping? You know, in interestingly, the, in, you know, there's a lot of noise in the numbers, so it's difficult to make too many concrete inferences. But it, we believe we've seen an acceleration of the switch. Uh, I think there's a lot of folks, just given how COVID um, attacks the lungs in the most severe cases, I think we've seen an acceleration of people trying to get off of combustible. Uh, either you know com quitting entirely, which is obviously the best the best option for them, or switching to a vapor product, which is a reduced risk product. You know, we were talking about this before, but you know, somewhat surprisingly, the uh, the FDA hasn't slowed down its application processing during this pandemic, which I think you found to be a positive surprise. No. Yeah. So all, all of the applications were due May twelfth. Uh, we were fortunate. Uh, the comp I say we, the company is called Enjoy. Enjoy was fortunate and then they got their applications in in March uh, and then COVID happened. Um, and uh, Jewel in particular uh, went, went to the FDA and said, look, we, we need more time because we can't complete our application with all the labs closed, with all the population um, uh, survey firms closed. And, and uh, that deadline was extended till September 9th. So the current deadline is September 9th and we'll see if that gets extended again or not. But uh, there was a concern amongst those that had gotten their applications in, like Enjoy, that uh, the FDA would go pencils down, um, given that they have a lot of other uh, areas they're focused on, and, and the realities of just a work-from-home uh, environment. But what we've seen um, 
uh, is that that's not the case, that they're, they're plowing through applications. I think that they, uh, my belief is that they want to get the applications that did get in before COVID shut everything down off their plate because they realize that they're going to get a whole nother batch of applications September 9th. So just last week, last week or the week before, but very recently, uh, Philip Morris got an, what's called an MRTP uh, for their ICOS product, which is uh, a modified risk uh, label. So they can actually make statements like this product is, is, um, is not as harmful as cigarettes. And the fact that that was approved during this COVID time shows that the FDA is still plowing through these applications. And that's a good thing. Yeah, thanks for that summary on your largest investment. And Jason, just to shift gears, when you look at the gold market today, there's obviously a lot of buzz based on, you know, QE infinity, you know, rates at zero for pretty much as far as the eye can see. And gold's finally started to catch a bid. But, you know, one of the interesting positions you have is in the gold miner Highcroft, which was a classic post-drug equity. So you don't want to walk people through, you know, where we are in that life cycle and how you think it's a better way to play a continued bull run in gold than just being long bullion or the futures? Yeah. And, um, so look, High, Highcroft's an interesting one. We, we bought Highcroft about five years ago out of bankruptcy, uh, us and a couple other uh, 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 firms. We basically made the company a debtor in possession loan. So it's a priming loan you can make in bankruptcy um, to help them uh, get through their restructuring. And we added a convertibility feature. Um, so we were secured by all the assets that the company had, which we thought covered the loan. But, uh, you know, if gold were to move materially higher, uh, gold miners are about as levered away as, uh, as possible to play um, gold price appreciation. We would participate in that upside through the convertibility feature. Um, so, you know, when, when I bought it, I really looked at it as almost a contra asset. I mean, contra asset is the wrong description, but I really looked at it as a hedge, even though it was a long, like it wasn't a short, but it, it was a long, but I thought, you know, if, 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 um, if things ever went south in the economy or something very bad happened, there's always a flight to safe havens and gold is usually one of those. Uh, and we, because of the convertibility feature in the dip loan, we, you know, we would benefit materially from that. So uh, this is sat on our books. Uh, and I know I've talked about it with you and, and your team in the past, but it's basically been dead money for a long time. Uh, and then COVID happened. Um, and you know, what we were able to do earlier this year is uh, get the company public. So it's now listed on NASDAQ. So we merged it into a SPAC uh, to get it publicly traded. Um, the ticker is HYMC. Uh, so it's now listed as of last month. And it is a very large gold deposit sitting in Nevada. Uh, so we have almost 20 million proved and probable ounces of gold. Uh, the um, the NAV5 um, uh, using $1,300 gold is over $2 billion. And if you plug in current spot prices, so that we produce silver as a byproduct too, but with silver at $19 and gold at $1,800, I think the NAV is uh, close to $5 billion. Um, and what's, you know, what's particularly interesting about it today is you know, we took it public through a SPAC. Investors in SPACs tend to not care about companies that are merging uh, necessarily, um, they tend to be sort of more, you know, doing the arbitrage around the SPAC and also, um, you know, mining assets are very unique assets. A lot of the people that invest in um, gold assets uh, don't know about Highcroft. So as I think about the next six to 12 months, no comment on what gold's going to do. Gold's been obviously been very well bid. As we sit here today, it's, it's, it's at a, it's at a high uh, of this cycle at 1808. Um, but no, no, no comment on, on gold. You know, this stock is very illiquid. It's not covered by any sell side research. It's not on any exchange. And what I expect to happen over the next 12 months is we'll see five to 10 sell side research cups, uh, uh, shops pick up coverage. More liquidity will come back to the name. And if it trades in line with where its competitors trade, um, there's meaningful upside, potentially two to three times where it's trading today. So we're pretty bullish on, uh, on Highcroft. Yeah, that's a, that sounds like a great way to play uh, continued bull market in gold. Um, but we, we're running out of time. So I just want to segue back into the classic distress cycle that we're in. You mentioned before there's still two to 300 billion of distressed companies because what we hear from people quite often is, hey, you know, liquid IGs rallied, liquid high yields rallied. The opportunity is not going to be as big as people thought maybe, you know, at the end of March. But there's still ample supply to go after. And defaults are only going one way, which is higher. So can you, you talk to us about the, the broader opportunity that we can get into some specific sectors you're focused on? 
Yeah, no, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, you just call, call any restructuring lawyer or any restructuring financial advisor that you know and ask him if, if, if he's slowing down, uh, he or she is slowing down. I mean, the, the, we're in the first inning of the actual restructurings. Um, you know, what happened in the markets in March, you know, and then subsequently in April and May as they rallied back is, is different than what we do. I mean, we, we focus on the deleveraging events. So the fact that some IG, IG bonds traded from 105 to 95 and are back, right back to 105 or some higher grade high yield traded down 15 points and is right back to par, that's not really what we do. I mean, I think that was a great opportunity for those that do it. And I think guys made a lot of money, uh, you know, but that, that, that was sort of the trade. It was the, um, the, the trade of the cycle and we'll see how that plays out. You know, what, 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 what's gonna drive defaults is uh, economic activity. Um, and we are in a slower economy, right? The, the world was priced for perfection, as we talked about earlier, in terms of debt to EBITDA multiples being very high. And we are in a slower economy now. Now, some industries are doing fine, and some industries are going to come back uh, a lot faster as, as uh, you know, everything reopens again and, and we recover. But some industries are, are never going to come back. Um, uh, you know, think about um, department stores. Uh, they were probably going away over the long time, you know, over the long period of time. Uh, Lord and Taylor's is a store that, you know, I shopped at growing up. I and mean, that was going away over the next 10 years, but it went away in 10 days when COVID started, right? So, you know, COVID has really been um, an accelerant of change. And, uh, you know, you know, think of business travel. Uh, we were talking about this before um, before we went live just now. I mean, bu- business travel, I don't know when it get, gets back to 2019 levels. I mean, I think people have just realized that video conference technology is pretty good. Like, it's not the same as being in the same room as, as someone, but, you know, it's 90 or 95 percent there. So I, I, I expect that, you know, it's going to be there's going to be a long period of time, even once there's a vaccine and COVID is a thing of the past. I don't think people are going to travel for business the way they used to. So, you know, with you know, you, you know, and that's a good segue into, you know, what industries we're looking at, but we, we are in a slower economy. There's massive disruption in industries all at a point in time where there was sort of maximum amount of corporate credit. And that, and those two, you know, those two ingredients are a good recipe for, you know, having a lot to do. So what I've told folks is I think this is a three to five year cycle. Um, we're in the first inning of it, you know, in terms of the actual defaults, not what's going on with the S&P or the NASDAQ or, you know, higher grade, high yield you know, the triple C stuff, the stuff that really needs to equitize. We're, we're very early in that, in that, in this, uh, in this game. And which sectors in particular, Jason, are you looking for good company, bad balance sheet? Cause it seems like there's more prevalence of that than just dying retail, for instance. Yeah, well, we're doing a lot in travel. Um, not surprisingly, um, you know, we own a company um, called CX loyalty, which administers loyalty points for financial institutions. So that's been impacted um, a lot by, uh, you know, by the shutdown in travel, we're, we're, we're involved in travel port. Uh, I can't really talk about that one because we're restricted in it, but that's an Elliott portfolio company. Uh, one of the, th- one of the three GDS is globally. Um, we're involved in some in-flight connectivity companies, so GoGo, Global Eagle. Um, so there's, there's a lot to do around travel I and mean, we don't own, you know, airlines uh, or cruise ships per se, but a, a lot of the companies that provide services to the industry, you know, are very distressed right now, but uh, you know, away, away from travel, um, very diversified across industries. I mean, the, the theme, if anything, is LBOs. I mean, there was just, um, you know, to your point about good business, bad balance sheet, um, most LBOs are, are, you know, reasonably good businesses um, that have predictable cash flows that can be levered, but they have a bad balance sheet because they finance the purchase price with a lot of debt. Uh, there's a lot of first lien debt trading at 80 cents right now. Some of which is going to go to 60 because the company's not going to make it, and some of which is going to go to par because the company is going to make it. And as long as we have a ton of situations like that to look at, um, you know, with debt trading in 80, there's just there's just a, there's there's ways to make money. Well, Jason, it's a fantastic summary of the opportunity set as well as some of your key investments going forward. And we just want to thank you for being on today. I'm going to turn it over to my partner John Darcy who's going to ask you some questions from the audience that are things people are eager to hear about how much money you're going to make the next two to three years, which is what it's all about after all, right, my friend? <laughs> Thanks, Troy. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you too. Yeah, Jason, you mentioned GoGo and we had an audience question about that. So 
you talked about how you don't think business travel is, is maybe ever going to get back to 2019 levels and is very challenging. So what's your investment thesis on something like GoGo that, that uh, likely relies a lot on revenue from business travelers? Well, um, look, I, I, I was specifically talking about business travel. Uh, I think business travel, the recovery in the business travel world, I think there's a secular change there um, and that will take, take much longer. Uh, vacation travel, so personal travel, uh, we're actually seeing some early green shoots that that's going to come back strong. Uh, there's a lot of pent up demand for, uh, for travel. Um, and I think as soon as people feel safe getting on airplanes again, you're going to see uh, a lot of pent up demand there. So I think you have to think about uh, the two categories differently. You know, what's interesting about GoGo uh, in particular is uh, that they, they have effectively have a monopoly on private jets. So they call it business aviation. Um, that business uh, alone, you know, they're in 95% of, um, uh, of private jet uh, in-flight connectivity is GoGo. So it's effectively a monopoly. Uh, and, you know, private jet travel, uh, we've actually seen uh, in July, for July 4th week and 5% year over year increases. Um, so you're already seeing that business come back. It is a safer way to travel, uh, or at least perceived to be for a lot of folks that have uh, the ability to access that luxury. Uh, and what's more interesting for us as, as uh, you know, financial analysts is most of those contracts are subscription-based. They're not usage-based. So even when people weren't traveling, a lot of people were continuing to pay their monthly costs to have uh, GoGo active. So we actually think that the cash flows from the business, aviation side of the business, uh, will be, they'll be down year over year, but not down that much. You know, if, they, if that business did 140 of EBITDA last year, we think it's going to do like 120 uh, this year or something in that neighborhood. And that business alone is probably an eight to 10 times business and, and covers the lion's share of the senior debt. It actually covers all of the senior debt uh, and even some of the junior debt. So our thesis is really about um, uh, the personal, personal travel and business travel being different, but also business aviation being a much sturdier business model than commercial aviation. All right, thank you for that. The next question is around uh, investment structures. So you recently raised a longer lockup private equity style vehicle. Are these types of structures going to be necessary for distressed investing in this cycle? I think they are um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, distressed credit focused investment firms have gotten so large relative to the last couple of cycles. It's very common to have a very concentrated ownership of companies when they emerge from bankruptcy. And what, what that means is that the post reorg equity can be very illiquid. Um, it's very common for five or six funds to own 80% of a company. And it's sort of hard to, you know, just relist that company, which is what we used to do in the sort of 01 to 08. You know, you would take the company through bankruptcy and just relist it on the New York Stock Exchange and liquidity would come back to the name and you would exit. Today, uh, the holding period is much longer. You usually come out of bankruptcy as a private company. You continue to fix things and then you go do an IPO. You know, we merged Highcroft with a SPAC to get it public. You can merge with with, a, with a, another public company that's not a blank check company, a strategic company, you could sell the company in an auction. But if the holding period used to be 18 months, it's now two to three years, sometimes longer. Um, so when you're dealing with longer hold periods, uh, it's just more prudent to have longer lockup capital. So we, we've been focused on private equity-like funds. So not 10-year funds, but not quarterly liquidity, something in between, call them hybrid funds, right. where you have sort of three or four year investment periods, and then you can harvest the investments. And the second thing is, you know, we, as I mentioned earlier, we focus a lot on, on mid, mid, sort of middle market situations. So those are just going to be inherently less liquid. Uh, you get better value. They're less efficient. Uh, so the value that we're looking for is there. The mispriced securities are there, but it's hard to do that with monthly or quarterly, quarterly liquidity. You, you really need... Um, uh, to know that you're going to uh, be able to you know, be around and, and see these things out. And um, that can take years. So we have a follow-up question about your Enjoy investment, which is the e-cigarette company. You know, just talk through again your investment thesis and then how you think the S'mores IPO changes or doesn't change the return trajectory uh, for your Enjoy investment. And how do you size something like that? Yeah, um, good question. So, um, you know, look, for, for those of you that don't know who S'mores is, S'mores is the largest uh, manufacturer of these products. Uh, so Juul does their own manufacturing, but um, British American Tobacco products, Altria's old product, they've, they've taken it off the market when they made the investment in Juul. Our product, um, Japan Tobacco's product, all produced by S'mores uh, in Asia. 
they just IPO'd and I haven't really followed it, but my understanding is uh, it's done very well and, and doubled. So uh, look, it's not, it's not the same business that they're, they're producing the products that um, uh, we're distributing them um, and, and we own the product and the brand, <clears throat> but you know, it's obviously a good thing. I mean, you, 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 you know, if you said, would you rather have s'mores trade down 50% or trade up hundred percent? I would say I'd rather have it trade up hundred percent because right. it shows there's demand for these, um, uh, for this industry, you know, what, what's really exciting ab about Enjoy is, um, you know, because of the way the regulatory environment uh, has been set up, there's very few players and almost all of the players are owned by big tobacco, right? So Views is the number two product. Views and Alto, it's the same sort of family of products, uh, is owned by Reynolds slash British American Tobacco. That they're, they're the same today. Um, uh Jewel is effectively owned by Altria. They have a minority investment in them, but it's effectively owned by Altria. Um, and the current CEO is a former Altria executive. Uh, Logic is owned by Japan Tobacco. Imperial, uh, I'm sorry, Blue is owned by Imperial Tobacco. And then there's Enjoy, which we control uh, and is owned by private investors. Um, so there's a real scarcity value if you think about the big five players. Um, if you want to invest in the disruption of the combustible cigarette, there's no way to do it, right? If you want to invest in views, you have to buy British American tobacco stock and you're getting 80% combustible or 90% combustible, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, so there's, there's really no way to invest in the disruption of the combustible cigarette absent something like Enjoy. So I'm very bullish on potentially a public offering. Um, uh, you know, I think it, I wouldn't be surprising to see one of the strategics acquire Enjoy before it goes public, but if in theory, Enjoy was a publicly traded company, it would be the only publicly traded way in the U.S. to play the disruption of the combustible cigarette. And I think the scarcity value of that alone, not not not, not to mention the some of the, just the sheer size of the of the market, uh, the TAM is a hundred billion dollar market. Um, uh, you know, I think the fundamentals would support a very high valuation, but the scarcity value alone is really interesting. And you know, the market's obviously valuing growth right now and disruptions. I mean, look at Tesla. Look at the fact that the Nasdaq's up 16% year to date, and the Dow's down 8%. Um, there's, there, you know, growth is is there's a real premium placed on growth and disruptions, and Enjoy has both those going for it. So I'm I'm, I'm bullish. I think S'mores helps, um, uh, you know, for sure. Would you use a, a SPAC to take Enjoy public? We had Chamath Palihapitiya on an early Salt Talk, uh, and he he took Virgin Galactic public via a SPAC. Is that something you would look at in the case of Enjoy? Yeah, I mean, look, SPACs are interesting because you can do them quickly. Um, they've already gone through the IPO process. Uh, so it's really a merger negotiation and you, you can get the company public quicker. There's a little bit more appetite for situations that have hair around them. Um, uh, that being said, there, there's some negatives and you know we were the sponsor of a SPAC, so I'm intimately familiar with this, but there's a lot of dilution uh, to the upside from the warrants that you need to issue uh, to get a SPAC uh, public. So you know we'll we'll consider we'll consider anything when the time is right. Um, I think that the the size of the market uh, is such that this this is probably more likely a regular way IPO uh, if you had to ask me today. But the landscape is changing very quickly. Um, a, a lot's changed just in the last twelve months, and I expect things will change uh, over the next twelve months. So I can't make predictions, but um, like Enjoy is of the sizable, um, you know, e-cigarette producers that are sold at convenience stores and gas stations throughout the country. So nationwide distribution, Enjoy is the only one that's independently owned that has sizable market share. And that, that I think is particularly interesting. Before I get into a couple of the last questions, I want to give you an open forum to talk about any other individual investments that you think are interesting and, and demonstrate your investment style. We talked a little bit about Enjoy, GoGo. Are there any others that we haven't covered that you think are interesting? Um, no, look, we 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 we're not here really to talk talk about our our book so much. I mean, I'm glad you asked about, uh, uh, you know, Enjoy and Highcroft because they, I think they're they're unique situations. Um, you know, look, bo both of them are actively um, controlled situations. So we control the board of Enjoy. Uh, we don't control the board; it's independent uh, uh, of Highcroft. But we are the chairman of the board, not me, but uh, one of the guys that works here, David Kirsch. So I think, and, and, and they were both, you know, smaller, more off the run deals. And they were also pretty contrarian, buying a gold mine out of bankruptcy, buying an e-cigarette manufacturer out of bankruptcy. 
I think there are interesting um, trades to talk about how we have differentiated ourselves. Uh, it's not, you know, Pacific Gas and Electric Bonds, um, which, you know, we looked at, but hard to really have an edge in a situation like that where every distressed guy on the planet is, is taking a hard look. Very few right. people looked at those two situations. And, you know, Highcroft is, is uh, you know, is actionable for, for those that are watching that uh, are looking for an interesting way to play gold. I and mean, you can't really invest in Enjoy uh, outside of our firm uh, because it's private. But now that we've listed Highcroft, if you're looking for a highly levered way to play gold with a lot of catalysts, uh, mainly liquidity coming back to the name, people just understanding that it exists, uh, it trades at around 0.2 times NAV uh, and comps trade you know, between 0.6 and, and one time NAV. Uh, if we traded close to comps, uh, you know, it would be a 20 to $30 stock. So I, I think that's sort of a you know, particularly interesting one since it was already brought up. So we have a question. If you're familiar, uh, what are your thoughts on the recent ruling on Serta, Simmons, and Apollo? Yeah, um, <laughs> look, you know, uh, you know, I- I- interesting that it happened to Apollo because they're usually the, the one, um, pardon my French, but doing the screwing. <laughs> and uh, tables we, were, we were, had were, Josh <laughs> Harris on. I'm telling you, he said that <laughs> the tables were turned a bit. Um, uh, you know, look, uh, you, you know, since we're talking about Apollo, we, we were involved in a, a Canadian oil and gas situation uh, five or six years ago, uh, where Apollo and GSO uh, did an up up tiering. They basically uh, exchanged their debt into senior debt and primed us and didn't let us participate. And we sued and we lost. And we appealed and we lost. And I think we appealed the appealing and we lost again. I think we're still like suing for, <laughs> for, for DNO insurance coverage. Um, so I've been on the other end uh, with them uh, just to see it happen to them what was somewhat um, uh, uh, ironic. But look, you know, w- we're involved in these situations all the time now. Uh, the fact is, um, one, of the, one of the things that we've seen through the cycle is a very loose covenants. And when you have loose covenants, you know, you're going to get companies that are going to be creative, financial sponsors that are going to be creative. And at the end of the day, what these situations, what's happening in these situations is, is companies have figured out a way to extend the, the, the optionality in their equity. And oftentimes that involves, um, you know, treating one class of creditors differently than the others um, in exchange for liquidity. Right now, liquidity is paramount. Um, so if you're willing to, to write to, you know, to put money into a company and the company can move you ahead of similarly situated creditors in exchange for getting that money, like the company should do it. I think as an investor, you just need to understand that risk. You need to handicap that risk. Um, um, and it, you know, if not, you're, you're going to wake up on the wrong side of a trade like that. Well, Jason, thanks so much for joining us. I want to give Troy one last word if he has any more comments or questions for you before we let you go. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks, Jason, for being on again. Um, once again, when you compare it to the 2001 to 2004 cycle, 07 versus through, let's call it 2010, 2011, do you think the return potential is equal or greater now? Or do you think it's more compressed because of Fed policy intervention? How, how do you see it playing out? Uh, I, I, look, I, I think um, this is the mother of all cycles in terms of the size. Right. I think, um, you know, we're, we're in a um, effectively a zero interest rate environment. Uh, so I think the sort of tailwind for, for equity markets over the next five to 10 years is not going to be what it was coming out of the 01 cycle. Um, but there's, um, you know, the market is, you know, 15 times larger. Right. So there's just I w- if you ask me, would you rather have a bull market or a lot to do? I would say I'd rather have a lot to do. So I'm, I'm, I'm bullish on this cycle because there's three trillion dollars of lever credit that not all of it's distressed, but a lot of it's distressed. Well, thank you so much, Jason. You're a real entrepreneur. Congratulations on all your success. And we look forward to many more years of success in the future. Thanks, Troy. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. 